All right, everybody, good evening. Open your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. <clears throat> This is the last chapter of the book. Uh, we started this class 52 classes ago. It was not 52 weeks ago because we took the summer off. Um, so this is the 53rd of these classes, and we are now finished. Well, Lord willing, we'll finish it. Uh, I expect us to finish it tonight. So let's just dive right in, and then we'll make final comments after we've studied it. Uh, 66 verse 1, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? There are two things going on in this final chapter. Uh, Isaiah talks about blessings that are going to come to those who are faithful to God. And that's almost entirely <coughs> presented through the prism of the Messiah to come. And then there's also the promise of punishment to those who reject the Lord. And that also is almost entirely viewed through the prism of those who reject the Messiah. And Judah's still kind of in the forefront of all this, but... Um, Isaiah is ending his book by really kind of emphasizing the bigger picture of what's going on and what they're building to and so forth. Um, now you could read this entire chapter, and there are some commentaries who will do it, especially the Jewish ones. Uh, you could read this as entirely about exile and going into Babylon and God saving them from Babylon. Uh, and if you read it that way on that surface level, there's nothing that really, a couple of moments but you, generally speaking, nothing really jumps out as, well, that doesn't work if it's about the exile. A couple little things here and there, but you could, you could make it work if it was about that. But the moment you insert the idea, do you see the Messiah here, it just starts to jump out like in three dimensions. You start seeing it with the red and green glasses. These things just pop out. It's obviously messianic. Uh, and since we've had 60, 65 chapters already, with Judah kind of in the foreground and the Messiah just kind of jumping out at you, there's no reason to look at this chapter any differently. So that's how we're going to look at it, that this is very much messianic, either accepting or rejecting. So it begins, 66.1, with God declaring heaven as his throne, which sounds like a common thing. You wouldn't really think much about it, but just stop and consider the ramifications of that statement and how Isaiah is going to use it. Heaven is God's throne. But if you ask your random Israelite or Jew, what is the throne of God? They're going to say it's the mercy seat, which is in the, the, the uh, most holy place of the temple, or before that, the, the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, we built this tent, and we put God's throne there, and that's where God's seat is. Well, no, that is not where God's seat is. He'll, he'll beam down every now and then to say hello, and remind you that he's there, and that everything's okay, or he won't if everything's not okay, but that's not his throne. The heaven is his throne. Not heaven, but everything that is up there is his throne, is the point that he's making. Yes, obviously, God is... Um, God dwells in heaven, right? But God is also here. God is everywhere is the point that he's making. Heaven is my throne. So if heaven is his throne, what is the earth? And I don't just mean this one little, you know, cube-shaped room inside of a rectangular tent, inside of a, a small, relatively unimportant, you know, worldly speaking, kingdom on the other half of the world. That, I mean, the whole world, all of it. If, if everything up there is where God's throne is, what is this one little planet? He says it is his footstool. So don't reduce God down to such a degree where you say this one little spot and this one little spot and this one little spot of this one footstool of yours, that's where you live. You see how degrading that is? That's what got Stephen killed when he said that, which is don't degrade God by trying to limit him and put him in a box and try to force him to be in a temple. God is bigger than a temple. He's bigger than your temple. And then they took up stones and killed him. So heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. And then he asked the rhetorical question, where is the house that you, that you build for me? Where could you ever build a house big enough to house me? And where is the place of my rest? The point, this is just a beautiful setup to everything we're going to talk about in this chapter. The point he's making here is, don't limit me to being the God of Israel. I am your God, and I chose Abraham, but I chose Abraham because through him would come the Savior, not of just Israel, but of the whole world. And through him I will redeem the world who wants to be redeemed through him to be saved, to live in a spiritual kingdom that is bigger than borders and bigger than walls and bigger than the cedars of Lebanon that house the frame of the temple and the gold that overlaid it and all of that. 
It's bigger than all of that. So don't limit me by making me just your little God that you can put in a box over here and only feed me when you're you know, thinking about me. 66 verse 2. For all these things have, me, have my hands made, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word. This is a direct shot, especially this latter half, of the Israelite who will say, well, I have fellowship with God, and he's living sinfully, he's living wickedly, he's not taking care of the poor, he's committing idolatry. And so if you ask them who's living like that, what makes you say you have a relationship with God? He'll say, you see that building over there? That's where God lives. That's my kingdom. I've got God in that box, so I'm good. And God says, the sky above you, infinite in its vastness, that's where I live. I don't live in your box. I'll come down there and wave hello once a year on Yom Kippur. That's what that's good for. The temple was not for God. The temple was for the people. God just allowed him, them to build it but don't limit him to it. And so you say, here's this building that I built it. And how could you dare say to God, that's good enough for you? Because what did you build it with? They built it with a bunch of wood and they covered it with a bunch of metal. That is melted metal. Sure, it was gold and it was shiny and it looks pretty in the sunlight, but it's just metal. That's, what is that to God? Anything that you could ever build any building for him with, he's already made the stuff that you're building. You see how redundant that is? I built you this building. With what? With beautiful, giant cedar woods, logs of Lebanon. I made the trees, God would say. Oh, I, I forget that, forget that. I spent decades carving out of solid granite, this beautiful granite building for you. I made the granite. Oh, but I found gold and we scoured the world and we chiseled and we chipped away. We got enough gold we could melt down that we made you a solid gold temple. I made the gold. It rains diamonds on Neptune. He made diamonds. It's nothing to him. It doesn't blow him away. Anything you could make to make him a house, he's already made. So it's redundant. All those things did my hand make. So don't put me in that box and think that means that I get to live however I want because I've got God. You don't have God. God has you, but he only has you if you're the kind of person God wants you to be. Second half of the verse. To this man will I look. To what kind of person is God pleased? He is pleased with the person who is of a poor and contrite spirit. The one who is humble before him and who trembles at my word. In other words, you can't just say to God, I have a good heart, because you may, but you're not obedient, so it doesn't matter. You also can't say to God, I'm doing all the things you said to do, if you're a jerk about it, because that doesn't work either. You must have a poor and contrite spirit and tremble at his word. you got to have them in tandem. Which takes us to the bitter, angry, cynical, resentful, hating God Israelite in Babylon who's going to be there, hating God every minute they're there, though they won't admit it to themselves, or certainly to anyone else. But they're going to be hating God while they're there, and they're going to be keeping up the sacrifices they're supposed to do. They're going to be following the calendar. It's time to offer my sacrifice. I'm going to get my lamb. I'm going to offer my lamb. But hatred is going to be in his heart. Look at verse number 3. He that kills an ox is as if he slew a man. And he that sacrifices a lamb like he's cutting off, a dog's, uh, cutting off at a dog's neck. And he that offers an oblation, as if he offers swine's blood. He that burns incense, as if he blesses an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. Let's just put pen to paper. Let's look at the little boxes we've got to check. All right, look at the list again. Kill an ox. All right, that's what God wants, so I'll do that. Kill a lamb. That's what God wants, so I'll do that. Offer an oblation. That's what God wants, so I'll do that. Burn incense. That's what God wants, so I'll do that. Those are God's ways, right? So I do all those things, yet God says, you've chosen your own way. It's not my way, God. I've killed your animal over here. I killed this animal over there. I offered this gift over here. I burned this weird powder over here. I'm doing it. Why are you saying it's my way? Because I'm not looking at what you're doing. I'm looking at you who's doing it. And he sees the you who's doing it. And he says, you're offering this ox, and as you cut it open, you're hating me as if I was the ox. You're trying to cut my throat. You're not offering a sacrifice to me. You're taking your hatred of me out on that sacrifice. You're opening that lamb's throat. I can't believe I have to be here to do this stupid to be. I'm going to offer this lamb. Here, here, take your goat. Take your goat. Take your lamb. Leave me alone for next week. I'll see you in a week. Problem this in the present still. Here, take your song. Here, give me, give me the sermon. Let's, let's hear it. Get over it. Get over it. I got, I got a fried chicken in 30 minutes. Let's go. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Fine. See you in a week. What have you done? 
you could have slept in, would have done you more good. You could have just slept in. You would have woken up in a better mood. And instead you got up grumbling, you drove here grumbling, you sat there grumbling, you mumbled through the songs, you grumbled through the sermon. Sorry, sometimes they're 40 minutes long. Sorry. You grumble through the sermon, and you grumble all the way home, and your kids grow up grumbling. Why? Because they hear you grumbling all the way home, and you'll wonder, what happened to my kids? Must be the preacher's fault. No. I get them three hours a week. You grumble, you grumble, you grumble, and you expect just to waltz into heaven like you own the place. And you, some, some people are going to be shocked when they're turned away. And they're going to dare to say to God, but I did the thing, I did the thing, I did the thing, I did the thing. Yes, you did. You wasted your time. Because as you opened the throat of your goat, as you opened the throat of your lamb, as you tossed your 20 in the plate, you grumbled every step of the way. You were blessing it. You were, you were offering an oblation and burning incense as if you were offering it to an idol. Verse 4. I also will choose there, my Bible says delusions. My Bible also says choose, which the better word is try, judge, as he does. So let's translate it that way. I will judge there, mine says delusions, literally childish follies. He watches those Israelites in Babylon who are there because they sinned against God. God didn't just wake up and choose violence one day. They, they chose to sin against God. He chose to punish them because that's his right as a judge. So he condemned them to Babylon for their sins. Now in Babylon, they're grumbling against God. Now grumble at yourself. You're the ones who sin. But they're over there and they're grumbling. And he says, you stubborn children. I put you in time out and I'm listening to you mumble and grumble. How, you think you're going to get out of time out grumbling? No, you're going to sit there until you realize what you've done. Until you're sorry. Thus they're there. I will, I will try their childish follies, and I will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spoke, they did not hear. and said they did evil before my eyes, and they chose that in which I delighted not. God wants a relationship with his nation. Every relationship. I don't care if it's husband and wife, father and child, mother and child, person and God. Every relationship is built on the webbing, the foundation, the thing that holds it all together, the structure of communication. And if you don't have communication with God, if you don't know what He wants, and if you're not telling Him what you want, you're not going to have a relationship. It's going to break down, which happens to Judah. The, by the way, there was never a point in Judah's history where they just all stopped en masse offering worship to God. Up to the moment Babylon shows up, they were still going and not tossing their goats on the altar. They weren't doing it because they loved God, and they were immediately running off to their pagan altars to offer to those gods too, but they were still showing up. They were still sitting in the pew. They were still singing the songs. But it didn't matter. 66.5 So hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you and cast you out for my name's sake, they said, let the Lord be glorified. End quote. But he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. Starting here, for several verses, let's talk about the faithful, not the unfaithful. The faithful are going to hear the unfaithful. Their faithful are going to hear the faith. Sorry, the unfaithful are going to hear the faithful. The bad are going to hear the good saying in Babylon, God will redeem us. God will get us out of here. God brought us in. God will take us out. Trust God. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Those who are going to hear that being said, and they're going to say, yeah, right. Pull the other one. I don't believe it. It's not going to happen. Let's see God be glorified. Let's see the Lord do His thing, because I don't believe it's going to happen. That'll be the day. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's going to happen. They have no faith. So God says that's what they're going to say, but God will appear. God will appear not to their joy, but to your joy. They won't have joy. They might pretend, and they might have momentary euphoria, but they will not be happy, because they will have been proven wrong. And nobody's happy to be proven wrong. But they will be proven wrong, and so they will grumble on their way out of Babylon those who are fortunate enough to live and not die there. But he will appear to your joy in Baal 6. And he'll appear with a voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice from the Lord that renders recompense, payback, punishment, vengeance to his Babylon complete. The people will return home. And that building which was restored or destroyed, they will see restored. Now, this is not literal. I mean, yeah, that will happen. They'll rebuild the temple. It'll be smaller and the old people will cry because it's not as pretty. But that's not what Isaiah is talking about. He's looking bigger. He's looking spiritual. He's telling the people, you're going to come out of Babylon. You, you people who were faithful and you held on and you believed when they didn't, he's going to appear. That's when, Whenever God appears in the Bible or you talk about the coming of Christ or the coming of God, the coming of the Lord, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean 
coming down from heaven in a bodily form. It's God's paying off what He promised. So God will appear to you. God will pay off His promise that He will redeem you. So He'll bring you out of Babylon and He's going to start over. You'll have this brand new Jerusalem. And so a brand new Jerusalem means you have a brand new temple. Not the physical building. This is the spiritual Jerusalem. This is the spiritual temple. This is the spiritual restoration through the Messiah who's going to bring them home as well again. So that's for them. For those who don't believe, recompense, payback for the enemies. Now, about that people who were in exile, that Jerusalem of old, that old Zion, that old Israelite nation, before she, verse 7, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before she ever had her first labor pain, she's already delivering a baby. Before her pain came, she delivered. What's it say she delivered in your Bible? She delivered a son. Hmm? Male child. Male child? What do you have? She delivered a son. A son? Okay. Before she had her first pains, she already brought forth her child. It's not like she, before she ever knew she was pregnant, she suddenly found herself in pain. It's not uh, before she ever realized what was going on, suddenly she's in labor. It's, it's, she's already having the child. She's delivering the baby. It's already here before she even knew she was with child. But Israel should have known she was with child. The child in the metaphor that's given to us for the next few verses is the new covenant of Jesus Christ. It's the new kingdom of Christ. It's the Messiah in particular. However you want to approach it, it's that newness that is coming post-exile. And it's being carried by Jerusalem of old, by Judah of old, like a mother carrying a child. She's nine months. She's ready to pop it. She doesn't even know it. Suddenly she's just going to have this thing up here and she's not even going to know where it came from. Well, she should have known, but she was too stubborn and too hard-hearted and too focused on the immediate to see the plan of God come into fruition. So before she even has her labor pain, she's bringing forth a baby. Verse 8. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen something like that? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or should a nation be born all at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth children. The, the moment she has her first pain of, ah, boom, baby's here. Just like that. Has that ever happened? Can that happen in that way? At least in the poetic sense? No. Who can hear of such a thing? The idea that a kingdom, an entire kingdom of people, can be established in a day. Can't be done. What's that they say about Rome? It wasn't built in a day. But the kingdom of the Messiah was built in a day. In one day, it went from being non-existent to having 3,000 members. Within a month, it had like 10,000 members. Just like that. How is that possible? How do you build a building like that? How do you build walls? How do you build fortifications? How do you elect representatives? How do you? It's not that kind of a kingdom. It's not of this world. So once you're playing in the spiritual realm, things happen very quickly. It can be built in a day. Uh, and, and that is built in a day, that kingdom of Christ. And old Zion is the mother of it. She's the one delivering this into the world. In this metaphor, 66 verse 9. Shall I bring to birth... God's asking a couple of rhetorical questions here. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord. Next question. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, says the Lord. So two questions. Number one is, shall I have a baby without a pregnancy? No, you can't do that. Shall I have a pregnancy with a barren woman? No, you can't do that. Uh, obviously not. This is God's way of explaining to the nation of Israel what her pivotal role is in the scheme of redemption. We're going to have this baby. We're going to have this amazing thing that comes into the world. It is the new kingdom of the Messiah. It is the home of the saved. It is everything that everything has been building toward. And you get to be the carrier of that. How important was Mary? Mary did not die on the cross for you. Mary's blood did not save you. But without Mary carrying the child who would, where would we be? How important is Mary? Now, Judah, you are so important. You are carrying the kingdom. And you will give birth to it to the world. Where does the kingdom of Christ begin? In what city on earth? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's your capital city. That's your city that's destroyed when you go to Babylon and will be rebuilt when you get out. I'm going to allow that to happen. I'm going to bring that up so that you, being this unaware, expected mother, can bring forth this salvation that the whole world can take advantage of. That's your role to play. You bring us to the Christ. You're the schoolmaster. Someone read Galatians 3.17. Someone read it. Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24.
So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. Yours says guardian. The old Bible says schoolmaster. Yes. What, the, what the word refers to is when the little little uh, Jew babies would run off to school, they want Jew, little Jew toddlers and little Jew young, young people would run off to shul, they would have someone appointed to carry them to the rabbi. The parents didn't do that. They didn't drop their kids off. They're off doing their whatever they're doing, their work or whatever. So somebody has to carry those kids like little ducklings off to their rabbi. And the one who did that was this, what my law calls the schoolmaster, the guardian, the bus driver. Hail to the bus driver, bus driver man. He, he doesn't drink any cuss and wreck all the buses. That's how the song goes. That's not what this one does. This one, this bus driver drives them to the school and delivers them safely to the rabbi. The job of the old law, and by extension, the nation of Israel around that law, was to bring the world up to the point where you could say, here's Christ. That's what the law was for, and that's what Judah was for. You're the mother giving birth to the Christ. They thought of themselves as the end of the road. They were not the end of the road. They were the road. Through them you get to Christ. Through them you get to what's coming. You're carrying the baby. Verse 10. So rejoice with, now my Bible says Jerusalem, doesn't yours? Verse 10, this is new Jerusalem. And you'll, you'll, I'll show you this when we get to it in a couple of verses. The context makes it clear. This is the new Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem giving birth to? Jerusalem. What is the nation of God giving birth to? The nation of God. What is this kingdom giving birth to? The kingdom. Old and new. Expired forevermore. So rejoice, everybody, with this new Jerusalem. And let's be glad with her. All you that love her, rejoice for joy with her. And all you that mourn for her, you don't need to mourn for her. Rejoice with her. Verse 11. Because you can drink at your mother's breast and be satisfied with her consolation. The old Bible says the way a mother can nurture and hold close a child in a way no one else can. That you may milk out. And be delighted with the abundance of her glory. This new Jerusalem is the mother of the world, of the saved world. This is not old Jerusalem. Old Jerusalem is the mother who gets to carry the baby to term. New Jerusalem is the mother of the babies who are born. Babies, plural, that come after. You have this one baby who will bring forth the salvation of the world. And that one big baby, which is the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom and the Messiah, it gets to be the mother of those who are born. You're going to carry them unborn. And then when they're born... You pass the buck over to the new kingdom that gets to milk them and nurture them and feed them. But why are we the nursing ones? We are the church. It, 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 I'm saying to you that the church of Christ, the kingdom of the Messiah, is the one nursing the babies of salvation. But we are the babies, so how are we nursing ourselves? I'm not the church. You're not the church. We're the church. I'm in the church. I'm part, you're part of the church. When you become a Christian, Christ adds you to the church. You don't just become the church. You're put in the church. It's a spiritual institution. That doesn't water it down or degrade it to make it that word. It is a spiritual institution. It's a thing that was conceived and built and is attacked and defended. It's a thing. And you're put in that thing. And together, collectively, all of us are that thing. But individually, you rely on that thing. You are fed by that thing. Fed what? Milk. What's the milk? The word of God. First Peter tells us. Now, Isaiah 66, verse 12. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall you suck, and you shall be born upon her sides. And my Bible says, Dandled. We'll come back to that old word. Upon her knees. God had earlier, somebody go back to chapter 48, 18. God had earlier told Israel that if they would be obedient to him, he would give them peace like a river. Somebody, 48, 18. So that you had paid attention to my commandments, then your peace would have been like the river of righteousness, like the waves of the sea. Would have, would have, but was not because they were not. They did not obey, they would not listen, and so the peace like a river they could have had, they were denied. That ship has sailed, now it is to the church. The spiritual Israel, the second Israel, the new Israel, the kingdom of the Messiah, to whom God extends peace like a river. It's a peace offered to Jew and Gentile, this text says flowing like a flowing stream. And he describes the blessings that come to those who are these children nourishing at the river of the Messiah. You have babies who need milk. 
who you know must suck to receive the milk. Then you have slightly older ones who are carried around on the hip. Mine says born upon the side. Slightly bigger, slightly grown. They've grown up, they're growing, they're getting bigger. Then you have even the bigger ones than that, like the toddlers who are, my Bible says, dandled, which means you put them on your knee and you bounce them. Because once they reach bouncing age, that's when you can have fun. And they can, they can fall and not break. And the little bitty infant, tiny small ones, you just need to give them to the mother, let her milk them, and just take a picture and admire them. But then slowly they get bigger, and you can actually touch them and hold them and not worry about snapping something. But then they're a little bit bigger, and you can bounce them. You can, no the Bible says, dandle them. They're slowly growing, in other words. We look at a, a, a child, a human physical in the world child, and we say, look how much they're growing. They're growing like a weed. What's happening? Well, they're being fed. They're being cared for. They're being loved. They're being fed. They're being provided. They're getting a good night's rest. The same happens in the metaphor spiritually. You're being fed spiritually, so you're growing spiritually. And God is looking his, your father at you, and he's saying, boy, you're growing like a weed. Verse 14, and when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones will flourish like a herb, or an herb, if you will. Is that what your says? Something like that? Grass. Okay, so that's it. You're right? you, 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 how fast does grass grow? Same idea. Look at you growing, 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 growing. Your bones flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord shall, you know, the British say herb. I know it's a person's name, but that's the word is still accepted. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. You take care of those who are yours. You defend them against those who are not. Verse 15. For behold, speaking of his enemies, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Faithful children, peace and comfort. Enemies of the family, enemies outside of the kingdom, outside of that spiritual institution, will suffer a just punishment. The Lord will give his enemies what he says, his furious anger in flaming fire. Doesn't that sound familiar? 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-8. Somebody please. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-8. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Who said that? Who wrote that? Paul. Paul. Isaiah wrote it first. Same Holy Spirit inspired him, but almost the, almost the same thing. You just heard that. Listen to the condensed version. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind. I know, I assume you've never seen it in, real, in reality, but if you were living back then and an army of, you know, a cavalry was approaching or a stampede was coming away and they were being pulled by chariots, the dust kicked up looks like a giant storm is approaching. A storm of war is coming your way. Well, that's coming in a divine sense. Chariots like a whirlwind. To render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And the Holy Spirit thought, that's really well worded. I'm going to save that. I'm going to give it to Paul in a few thousand years. 66.16 For by fire and by sword will the Lord, my Bible says, plead, judge, with all flesh. And the slain of the Lord shall be many with fire and sword sword swiftness fire severity god moves with precision and god moves with totality in his judgment now you got this is where i said the top of the the hour or the top of the class um if you're if you're looking at this purely from a 700 bc perspective then what you've got here is a picture of going into captivity and then god taking retribution on babylon fine it's, it tracks it's there but there's so much more to be mined from this than just you're going to go into Babylon, you're going to get out, and God's going to punish them along the way. Like that's all over the Bible. That's, I mean, the whole half, second half of the Old Testament. It's all over that. There's so much more to this when you have it in the context of this delivering this new kingdom and this new life that is coming, and everyone who is attacking you after it's delivered will receive ju judgment and justice. It's, it doesn't quite fit perfectly once you put it in the context. If you're saying God's going to punish Babylon and then we're going to get to go home, okay, well, but it's already established. If that's how you want to view it, then getting out of Babylon is like giving birth to the new nation of Israel of a physical sense, which means it's out of order. You're going to be out of it, Babylon, then he's going to punish them? That's not how it went down in history. He punishes them, and then you get out of Babylon because Persia is the one who punishes them, and Persia is the one who lets them go. So it, it doesn't track perfectly. You can kind of play a high-angle view of it and kind of broadly approach it that way, but once you get into the weeds of it, there's something more going on here than just go to Babylon, get out of Babylon, and he punches them along the way. It's not that. 
This is a spiritual thing that's happening, and the enemies of the spiritual will be punished by the spiritual judge. 66, 17. They that, speaking of those ones who are punished, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one, my Bible inserts the word tree, in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together with those already talked about, being consumed in the fire, says the Lord. In other words, those who commit abomination, those who don't walk in the way of God. Mind you, you're reading an Old Testament prophecy about a New Testament age, but he's not going to describe it in New Testament terms. None of the prophets of the Old Testament do that. They describe it in Old Testament terms because that's their initial audience. They had to put it in a way that they can understand, they can grasp. So what's a way that a person from Isaiah's day can appreciate someone uh, living in um, uh, rejection of God, living in total abandonment of the ways of God? You describe it as someone who is a part of the covenant of God, sin, sinning with abomination. And so what are the things described here? They sanctify themselves, they set themselves apart, and they purify themselves. So far, that sounds good, but they're not doing it in the divine standard. They're doing it according to pagan practices, because they go into the gardens, and my Bible says behind a tree. Does anybody's Bible say tree? Because it ought not. Gardens don't have trees. That's forests. Gardens have groves, and they have beautiful little areas, and they have little rock formations, and they have idol statues where the pagans would go and offer their sacrifices. And so they go there, and they eat swine's flesh. And it says, the abomination. Is it, eating swine's flesh is an abomination. It is. But this is a particular one he's singling out because that's kind of the catch-all for the worst thing you could do as a Jew is eating swine's flesh. And then every other thing you could do, they're doing that too, the abomination and the mouse because consuming rodents was part of some pagan practices, as disgusting as it is. They will be, they're consuming these things. Look at the play on words. They're consuming this and they're consuming that and they're consuming these and they will all be consumed by the fire of God's judgment. 66.18 for I know their works and their thoughts. A phrase that should give every one of us a moment of pause. He knows your works. I know your works too. That's just the things you do. We can all see it. We've got eyes. We've got ears. We can see and know what you're doing. I know your works. You know my works. But you don't know my thoughts. And I can fool some of you all the time. And I can fool all of you some of the time. But I can't fool all of you all the time. And I can't fool God none of the time. Abraham Lincoln. It shall come. Matthew Martin. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So, a divergent path here, a contrast. You have, I know their works and their thoughts. End of the thought of the past couple of verses. I'm going to punish them with the flaming fire, because I've seen what they've done, and I've seen why they've done it. Boom, they're gone, out of the picture. What's left? I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. How, I don't know if ironic is the right word. It's just, it's kind of, it's poetic in this way. You have these Jews, a select people, chosen, separated, set apart from the whole world. And what do they do as soon as they get set apart? They try to be as much like everyone around them as they can. So God says, you're going to be punished for that. Stop being try, stop trying to be like everybody else. Okay, what are you going to do now that you punished us? I'm going to invite everybody else to come into this new kingdom. It, it's, it, it fits that way. But he's not saying everybody can just be however you want. It's anybody can come in and be how I want. That's the difference. 66.19. So he's making this invitation to the whole world. How are you going to get them here? Because they're all the way over there, and some are all the way over there, and some are all the way over there, and you're over here. How are you going to get them to you? I'm going to put up a banner. I'm going to put up a beacon. I'm going to shine a bright light, my Bible says, and I will set a sign. What's yours say? Same, Same thing? I'm going to set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, that draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, into the isles afar of off, that have not heard of my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory unto the Gentiles. The pronouns in this verse have been the cause of much confusion and disagreement. So I want to give you what I think this is talking about. So it starts in verse 19. I will set a sign. Already there's disagreement. What's the sign? Is the sign the birth of Christ? Some say, yes, I don't. Is the sign the cross? Some say, yes, but I do not. I'll tell you why in a second. I think the sign is the resurrection of Jesus. We'll get that as we go later in this text. But whatever the sign is, notice what we're given about it in this text. It's going to be attached to a message that is taken to the Gentiles. And it's going to be taken by what's called a people who are those that escaped of them. Again, vague pronouns. Who, who is the those and who is the them? A certain people who are escaping from another certain people are going to take the sign to the Gentiles. All right? The preaching of the glory 
And the preaching of the message that goes to the Gentiles, you have a historical record for. You have a mark in history that you can say, this is that. And that's Acts chapter 8. You have people who have a message that they go out to deliver to the Gentiles. I mean, eventually it gets there. It's, but it starts there. You have persecution that happens to the church, to the kingdom, to God's people, who then take the message that caused them to be persecuted, and they spread it out everywhere they went. To Samaria and to uh, the Gentiles to the uttermost parts of the world, at least as far as they could go for the book of Acts ends. So it starts to spread that way. And that's the picture that's being painted for us here. But it's being painted for us, again, in terminology that the readers could appreciate. How do you describe something spreading out to various locations? <laughs> you give, bless you, locations that these people can appreciate. Tarshish, pulled in Lud, Tubal, and Javan. What is that? Tarshish, that's as far west as you can go that everybody knows. Like There are some people who knew there was more to the west than Spain. But everybody recognized and appreciated Tarshish. That's really, really far west, right? So you got west. It's going that way. You've got Put and or Phut, your Bible might say, P-H-U-T, and Lud. Those are two Persian cities famous for their um, uh, skill at archery and, and horse riding and things like that. They are good with the bow, he even says. And Jeremiah mentions them and Ezekiel mentions them uh, in their books. Then you have Tubal. So that's west. That's east. Tubal and Javan, that's Assyrian cities, north, or uh, Tubali at least, it's basically the same word in the uh, upper Euphrates. So you have really, really far west, you have really, really far east, you have really, really far north, or going to the north. It's painting a picture of this message that has been taken out and spreading all over. But it's taken out and being spread by whom? By those who have escaped. What, what have they escaped from? Well, if I have my reference point pinned on Acts 8, I have the answer already. They're, being, uh, they're escaping from those who are persecuting them. Who's doing the persecuting? The Jews who didn't appreciate the message that had been delivered there. The same audience of Isaiah where he is painting this picture. There's two kinds of my people. There's those who are faithful and there's those who are stubborn. There's those who accept it and there's those who reject it. That same picture continues until the time of Christ and beyond when there were Jews who accepted it. They become the first king Christians in the kingdom. They're not called that yet, but you know. And then there are those who rejected it. Those are the ones who became the first persecutors of the church in the world. And those who escaped that persecution did not run and hide and never preach again. They ran and they preached what? What message did they deliver to the Gentiles? Yeah, I'm sure they mentioned the birth of Jesus and I'm sure they mentioned the cross of Christ. But what was the big inciting thing that caused everyone to try to kill them in the first place? Like telling the, the Jewish community that Jesus died is just... The newspaper, everyone knows that Jesus died. Saying that he rose again, that's going to cause you to get stoned. And that's the sign that's going to be what triggers in somebody the reason to be converted. What is it that caused Paul to change? Not that Jesus died, it's that Jesus rose. What's going to be what appeals to Gentiles? Not the fact that some guy died, but that he got up again. That's the sign they're going to take. The foundation of which is the gospel. What are they taking out but the gospel to the Gentile world? That's the picture Isaiah is painting. He paints it in 700 B.C. terminology, but that's it. And they shall, those who go out and preach the gospel, they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord. Out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts, they're all going to come up to the holy mountain Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2. All nations will flow up to this holy mountain of God. Not the physical, literal, necessarily. You can go up there too and worship God. But not that anymore, it's the spiritual Zion, the spiritual Jerusalem, chapter 2 of this book. This 6620 is Isaiah 2's prophecy from the perspective of those going up the mountain to worship God. Saying the Lord, uh, they're going to do this, says the Lord. As the children of Israel brought an offering into, in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. There are going to be those who are faithful who are going to bring what is right. And those who are unfaithful who are going to persecute those who do. And I will, now here's where, if you're going to say, this is still just talking about you getting out of exile, you're getting out of captivity, you're going to go back to Jerusalem, you're going to go up the mountain and worship God again. Everything's going to stay like it's always been. We're going to be Jews forevermore, Israelites forever. You run into a problem here, 6621. I will take of them, I'm going to take my people, and I'll make them priests and Levites. But God's already done that. He's already separated the Levites. He's already said, these, these, i got five minutes, these are the ones who are my priests. But now he says, you're all going to be priests and Levites. And that just isn't how it is in Judea. But we are all spiritually Levites. We all spiritually belong to the priesthood, 1 Peter 2.9. We all serve God in the temple, which is our bodies. 66.22 For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. 
In other words, God tethers the existence and perpetualness of the spiritual kingdom to his own nature. For as long as he has eyes to overlook it, for as long as he has hands to uphold it, for as long as he has a heart to love it, that spiritual kingdom will remain. Can he say that about Judah? No, that kingdom does not remain. Not even anymore. Now, I know there's a nation of Israel, but it's not that nation. It's not that kingdom. Can you say this name of Israel will forever remain? No. Yeah, there are people who call themselves Israel, but they're not Israel anymore. Romans chapter 9 and 10 and 11. But the name that you get to wear, given to you through your conversion to Jesus Christ, that name will forever be, that's Christian. 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. Again, Old Testament terminology to make a New Testament point. The Old Testament worship to God was arranged all around the calendar. The moon's cycle of the month. The Sabbath creates a cycle of the week. It's one of the reasons why God rested on the Sabbath. Not the big one, but it's one of them. Because that starts the week over the next day. Otherwise, there is no other first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. There's four, sometimes five in a month. Every single month. 52 in a year. Sometimes 53. But if God had not rested on the Sabbath, there would just be one first day of the week. And it would be day one. And then the next Sunday would be day eight. And then we'd never call day one, day one again. But you have a new day one every single week because God rested on that day and started another day one. So you start this cycle. You create, God created the arbitrary de definition of a week. Whereas the moon, that's a, a universal cycle. The light goes away and the light comes back and you have the cycle of the moon. Earth goes around the sun. It creates a year, right? Earth spins around its own axis. That creates a day. But God arbitrarily made, I say arbitrarily from our perspective, made a week. So around that calendar, we have worship in the Old Testament. Well, we don't have that today in the New Testament, but they did. So that's the way he describes it. In other words, you'll have this... The schedule of when you get to worship God and you'll have the way that God wants you to do it, you'll have this God-ordained prescription for your relationship with Him. It's not just left up to you however you want to worship Him. You must worship Him the way God wants you to worship Him, which is the idea behind in spirit and in what? Truth. But anyone can do it. You can all come before me and worship Him. Um, oh, and, and the point being... From, it, it says, from one new moon to the next, one Sabbath to the next, on and on and on and on, forever, perpetually, you'll worship God. You will not stop worshiping God when Jesus comes back. Why would you do that? He's come back. The first thing you're going to do when He comes back is worship Him for coming back. And then you're going to keep on worshiping Him because you're never going to die. What is heaven going to be like? It's one of the most commonly asked questions of a theological nature. What's heaven going to be like? Church. That's it. If you don't like it, you're going to have a really hard time for eternity... Because heaven and heaven every day is Sunday. 66, 24. And they shall go forth. This is the last verse of the chapter. Those my people will go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die. Neither shall the fire be quenched and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. This is how the book ends. Which it seems on the surface like a word of warning. And a lot of it is. But there's something else to consider there. God has a very small, faithful remnant. If you're a Christian, that's you today. Back then in Judea, it was his faithful ones who would eventually produce the Messiah. He has a small, faithful remnant who listen to him, who want to listen to him, and who obey him. And when they do wrong, and you tell them they do wrong, they repent and come back to him. That's them. If, that's a, if you're a Christian, that's you too. But all around you are people who are not a small, faithful remnant. Or all around you are the majority. And they bag your groceries and you drive by them on the interstate, and they teach your children in, in public school. They are good people. Sometimes they're bad people. They, they sew up your stitches. They, they coach your children's little league. They're people, but they're lost. And they fall into one of two categories. They're people who are lost and are seeking, and they're people who are lost, and they don't care. But the thing of it is, I know who you are. I know you. You're my family. I don't know the difference between these two people. I don't know until I go. And I talk to them about the gospel. And then they either listen and obey or they listen and reject. But I can't tell the difference between them. God can, but I'm just told to go. I'm not told to judge or to differentiate. I'm said, who I am, here I am, and i got to go. And then I'll know who I need to keep going to or not. And that's the point he makes there. Listen, look at, look at the whole world around you. It is a whole world around you. You belong to a very small, faithful number of people. Few there be that find what you have. All around you are the people who will, according to this text, 
be the carcasses of the people who transgressed against God. Their worm will not die and the fire will be not quenched. You have a responsibility of taking the message of the gospel to all of these people. I had more, but I'll stop there. Because we'll have class next week. It won't be about Isaiah, but that's okay. That's Isaiah, basically. That's Isaiah. Thanks, everybody.